Hello, Petal. Hello, devil, are you? How are you doing? Have you been? I know it's only been a couple of days, but still, I'm really enjoying these conversations. I think I say that every time, but I really do. <laughs> so we've got a big chapter ahead of us today. Chapter four of May Contain Traces of Magic, J.W. Wells & Co. Book six. And as ever, if you could hit that like button, bing, bing, the notifications bell, share and subscribe if you want to, but you don't have to. Just really helps the channel, as you know. So... We're still waiting for this sunshine, but then again, I'm still waiting for snow. But then turning around saying it's going to be deluges of rain and it's all going to go, oof. How terribly British to talk about the weather. What's your favourite conversation piece? I'm not very good at that, the small talk thing. Actually, it's it's a scourge of mankind in my opinion, but you know. <laughs> Tell me what your favourite conversation top, topic is if you've got nothing else to say and you don't know the person you're talking to. Introverts unite! Woo! <laughs> right then, let's get this done because it's a big chapter and we're gonna I'm looking forward to it because it's a fun one. Right. So May Contain Traces of Magic, J. W. Wells and Co. Cool, book six, chapter four. Needless to say, Chris didn't tell Karen about the Pantacopt or the demons. He said he'd accidentally knocked the paperweight onto the floor. And it had busted the tile and broken in two. She sulked about it all evening, then swept off to bed like a diplomat walking out of peace negotiations. It disturbed him to discover how little he cared. He was pretty tired too, but he didn't want to go into the bedroom while there was any chance that she'd still be awake. So he settled down in the armchair with the book of all human knowledge. For some reason... The stupid thing kept wanting him to read about Gandhi, but he really wasn't in the mood, so he used his master key and looked up satellite navigation systems. Magical. Operated by a captive spirit, typically a nymph, sprite or genius loci, although entities as diverse as angels and demons have been successfully used. Generally, however, the spirit is a convicted criminal, condemned to life imprisonment in its native jurisdiction, which means that navigation spirits are usually only sourced from communities with whom the equipment manufacturers have made suitable arrangements. The spirit is kept restrained inside the apparatus by a variety of containment charms. Equipment offered for sale inside the EU must carry enchantments rated to level 9 or above under the terms of EU Directive 5567442-91B. Although considered safe for everyday use, these devices carry an undeniable element of risk. There have been authenticated cases of malign influence and possession, especially where the equipment is in daily use and the user is particularly vulnerable, weak-willed, impressionable, of below-average intelligence or starved of affection. Yep, Chris thought, that's me, five out of five. In cases where possession has become complete, very little can be done to save the victim, who is usually confined in secure quarantined accommodation, so as to prevent him from becoming a danger to himself and others. If the victim realises his predicament early enough, however, the possession process can easily be interrupted. Simple distractions, such as the playing of music or radio broadcasts, are often sufficient, and in most cases the victim will make a full recovery without unduly distressing withdrawal symptoms. Danger signs to watch out for include engaging the apparatus in conversation. Oh, he thought, more or less what Ben had told him, and if it was in the book, it had to be true. Although there wasn't much there that he hadn't already known, Reading it had left him feeling shaken and upset. He closed the book and switched on the telly, but he had to keep the volume so low in order not to wake Karen that he couldn't follow the plot and soon gave up. He decided it was safe to go to bed when the phone rang. Sorry to call so late. Jill's voice. I'm not disturbing you, am I? Just a second. He'd bought an extra long flex for the phone so that he could take it into the kitchen if anybody rang after curfew. That's better. OK, fire away. I was thinking, she said, about your demon. Are you absolutely positive you haven't left something out? Only I just can't account for why it didn't attack. Chris almost told her. 
about how the demon had reached past him and touched the satnav button. Things were different now, he could see that. Before the captive spirit's enchantment had made him want to protect it, now he knew the awful truth, so why shouldn't he tell Jill? Sure, she'd probably lecture him about being vulnerable, weak-willed, impressionable, of below average intelligence, and starved of affection, but he could handle that. He'd never had a high enough opinion of himself to be upset by the truth. Telling her would be the sensible thing to do, but he didn't. You're really, really sure? Yes, for crying out loud. Oh, Jill said. Right, in that case, it's a mystery. Look, about the car and Norman's clothes. You had to hand it to Jill when it came to making arrangements. She'd spoken to Mr. Bernards personally. He'd sounded very impressed when he found out who he was talking to. And of course Chris mustn't dream of coming back to work until after the weekend. Gerald from the department would call round in the morning to bring back his car and pick up the BMW and the designer clause, and there'd be a statement for him to sign. Just routine. Nothing heavy. Oh, and one last thing, she said, sounding rather too much like Lieutenant Columbo for Chris's liking. That packet of biscuits. What pa- In my carrier bag. You remember. Don't suppose you've had any further thoughts about that? Have you? No. Only hesitation. Very unlike her. Only that's another mystery. And I hate them. Oh well, never mind. See you Tuesday, as usual. Fine, Chris thought, as he put the fawn down and carried it back into the hall. But that wasn't what she'd started to see. Only. He'd be prepared to bet money on it had been the preamble to an explanation of why the stupid biscuits mattered so much and she'd started and then changed her mind. Why? Because she didn't trust him. Out of the question, after all these years, except, of course, that he'd been lying to her and he had nasty suspicion that she knew it. For two pins, he'd have called her back and told her about the demon and the satnav. But he didn't. Something was bugging him, and he couldn't quite reach it. Something that someone had said, some very little thing. Perhaps the way it had been said, rather than the words themselves. Chris got undressed and went to bed, but he couldn't stop rummaging around in his mind until, quite suddenly, he saw it, as clearly as if his eyes were open. The demon's long, thin arm, seen in the rear-view mirror, coming at him, going past, brushing his cheek. Only how could he have seen it? He'd had his eyes shut at the time. Maybe this wasn't his memory. And the clawed finger reaching out to touch, and then the voice of the satnav. Your route is being calculated. Please, oh. The last bit. Of course. At the time, he'd assumed it was just perfectly normal surprise. But it hadn't been at it. Not the, oh, short for, oh my God, what's happening? Because the inflections were all wrong. Surprise, yes, but too mild to be any sentient creature's reaction to waking up and finding a demon leering at you. Rather, it was, oh, it's you. What are you doing here? Implying implying, Chris thought, his stomach lurching, that she recognised it, she'd met it before, knew its name, if demons had names, knew where it should have been, hence the surprise to find that it wasn't. He opened his eyes, faint orange glow from the street lamp outside, bleeding through a crack between the curtains. Once your eyes had got used to it, you could make out shapes, the door, the fitted wardrobes from home base, Karen's dressing table. That was why the demon hadn't attacked him. Because of the satnav. No, that didn't work either. It had appeared, if he'd understood what Jill had told him, it took them a lot of effort to do that, moving from one dimension to another or something, Star Trek sounding like that. And it had grinned at him. And then it had switched on satnav. And then it had left. Satnav had recognised it, sure, but it hadn't stopped to talk to her or anything like that. 
grin, reach out, press button, bugger off. Still didn't make any sense. In fact, it was even more bewildering than it had been. Jill must have guessed, Chris thought. She must have known there was something weird going on, hence the phone call. Well, obviously he was going to have to tell her now, because there was no way he'd be able to keep something as crazy as that bottled up inside his head. He felt as though someone had stuck a hose in his ear and turned on the tap. He had one of those luminous-style watches, 3am, so even Jill would be asleep, and he couldn't phone her till morning. But the pressure kept building, until he couldn't bear to lie still. He slid out of bed, crept into the living room, quietly closed the door, and turned on the light. The book, he thought, tells you exactly what you really need to know. Chris didn't really believe that, just a sales pitch for the buyers, but it was all he could think of, and he had to do something. He pulled the book towards him across the table, opened it in the middle and saw Gandhi, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, born 2nd of October 1869, Porbandar, India, best known for his policy of non-violent resistance to British colonial rule, leading to independence in, for crying out loud, Chris thought, and went back to bed. He was tied to a rock on the summit of a cloud-cupped mountain, and around him soared four vultures, bare-necked, broad-winged, screaming as they swooped at his fierce talons extended, veering away a fraction of a second before making contact. At each swoop he flinched, but they judged the distance exactly. He could feel the slipstream, but the anticipated impact and tearing of flesh never came. One of the vultures was Karen, it's your turn to put the rubbish out, she screamed. You broke the tile in the kitchen and you never talk to me any more. He wasn't all that bothered about her. The second vulture was Jill and she was shrieking, You lied to me! You did eat my biscuits! I'm going to shave off all your hair and tell them you are hiding in the girls' toilets! He was sad to think that she didn't like him any more, but he recognised it was his own silly fault for violating her private personal plastic bag. So, fair enough. The third vulture was Angela, the trainee, and although she swooped and wheeled like the others, he could see that her heart wasn't in it, and she was bored, and it was just stupid, flying around in circles like this, but her mother was making her do it, and it was also a bitterly unfair. The fourth vulture was Julie on reception, same as usual. But then, and this had never happened before, a fifth vulture joined the flock, a huge black silhouette with an enormous wingspan. Not a vulture, uh, what's the word? Condor, like on the nature programmes. It didn't have a face, but as it rushed towards him, and he knew it wasn't going to turn away at the last moment like the others did, it was going to strike and take half his face away with it. He heard it call out, your immediate future is being calculated. Please wait. He woke up, and the voice wasn't that of a giant condor. It was the phone ringing. Beside him, Karen snarled ominously in her sleep, so he slid out of bed and tiptoed at the double into the hall. Sorry to call so early, Jill said, but I thought you ought to know. You're sat nav. Chris frowned. What about it? It's escaped. Three, maybe four times in Chris's life when he'd gone from three quarters asleep to very wide awake in under a sixtieth of a second. Once when Karen's parents had come home much earlier than expected. Once when he'd started to drop off at the wheel on the M5. None of them had been much fun and this time was no different. What, what the hell do you mean, uh, S? They just called me, Jill said. They prized open the casing and it was empty. Nothing there. Chris opened and shut his mouth a few times, goldfish fashion, then said, but, but that can't happen, can it? I mean, there's all those spells and... Well, apparently it has, Jill said calmly, and strictly between ourselves. It's not the first time. Oh. Most of the previous cases were on the early models, she went on, before they beefed up the defences, 
But there was one in Denmark just last year, a Kawagachir road imp, killed six people before they managed to catch up with it. Oh, the thing is, Jill went on, in nearly all the recorded incidents, the first thing the escaped thingy did was make a beeline for its owner. In fact, they think that's what prompts them to break out. They get sort of fixated on the person they navigate for, kind of like having a crush on someone, but also wanting to tear them limb from limb. Well, if they were well-balanced and normal, they wouldn't have been banged up in a plastic box to start with. Oh, Chris said, this time with extra feeling. And you think... There's no need to panic, Jill said cheerfully. Your car was in the secure compound at the time. We've got loads of warts and stuff. It's highly unlikely it'll be able to get off sight. But I thought I ought to warn you, just in case. Um, he said. I mean, right. Uh, thanks for telling me. Pause. Then, if it does, you know, show up here, what, what should I... Phone me, she said. Or the hotline, if I'm not here. You've got my mobile number, haven't you? Is that all? I mean, is there anything I can do while I'm waiting for you to get here? Tackle it yourself, you mean? Disapproval in her voice. I rarely wouldn't advise that. Leave it to us, all right? Jill paused, then added, It all seems to be happening to you at the moment, doesn't it? Yes. Odd. That. Yes. Another pause. And you're absolutely sure there's nothing you aren't telling me? It was the perfect opportunity. And it was so obviously the sensible thing to do because it was quite clear she suspected something. So Chris had nothing to gain by keeping quiet. And if the horrible monster from inside Satnav really was on the loose and out to hunt him down, surely it was the only common sense to tell Jill so she could help protect him. But he said... Look, you keep asking me that. If there's anything at all, I'd tell you, right? Yes, of course you would. I'm sorry. It's just such a coincidence, that's all. Mind you, we do have a couple of lines we're following up. Like, for example, there's something, some object you've inadvertently got hold of, and it's drawing them. You like the sound of that? Really? That happens, does it? It's not unknown. Could be some powerful magical artifact that they're keen to get their hands on, for example. Or maybe it's something they've made into a sanctuary. That's where they take some everyday thing and create a trans-dimensional bubble where they can hole up and rest. You know, a bit like a... Pocket universe. Chris interrupted breathlessly. I know all about them. <laughs> we sell them. I've got a dozen in my car boot right now. Uh, or at least you've got them, he added quickly. And bloody hell, what about the BB-27Ks? Could they hide in one of them? I don't know. What's a BB-27K? Portable parking space. Look, I'm no expert, but I think it works more or less the same way as pocket universes. Some dimension thing. And I carry loads of them as car stock... I've been trying to get rid of them all month, but you can't hardly give the things away. It's possible, Jill said sceptically, though I wouldn't have thought. There was that woman, Chris went on. One of the managers told me about her. Parked her car in a BB-27K and it fell through a hole into a completely different reality. Sounds just like you were talking about and they wouldn't have to adapt it or anything. It'd be perfect. All right, she said. We'll check them out, just in case. I suppose it could be something like that. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any other rational explanation. After she'd rung off, Chris crept back into the bedroom and fished the tape measure out of his pocket. Phone me. Leave it to us. Yes, right. And while he was holding and pressing one and listening to the four seasons, the ravening monster would be tearing off his head just like poor Mr. Newsom's. Well, he was a realist, so most likely the monster would get him, even if he did try and make a fight of it. That, or he'd cut off his own leg trying to get the tape measure out in a hurry. But at least he'd have stood a chance, if only very briefly. 
Better that his last moments on Earth should be characterised by futile valour than spent trying to explain about escaped fiends to someone in a call centre in Mumbai. Not much better, but still. Chris made himself a cup of coffee. Black, no sugar. More suitable, he felt, for a warrior than his usual milky sweet slop, and went through into the living room, trying to remember what he was supposed to be doing there. Karen had given him his orders for the weekend, something about stripping off wallpaper, but demons and fugitive monsters had driven them from his mind. He shuddered. Right now, if he was lost in a dark wood and a fiery angel appeared to him and gave him the choice between a life of heroism, adventure, selfless sacrifice and eternal glory on the one hand, and DIY and visiting Karen's relatives on the other, his only question would be whether there'd be time to nip into focus on the way over to Cousin Brenda's. But that's the bummer with life. You don't get to make the important choices at a convenient time. So true. Admittedly, he'd chosen to hide in the girls' toilets. Seemed like a good idea, but without knowing what the consequences of the act would be. At that crucial moment, when a fiery angel would have been a tremendous help rather than a health and safety issue, he'd been on his own, with nothing but the puerile blandishments of Benny Pickering to inform his decision. If only someone was ringing the doorbell. The postman, Chris told himself, or the Argos courier, or the Avon lady. Well, if they insisted on ringing at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning, they'd have to put up with the spectacle of him in his pyjamas. He lumbered into the hall and opened the door. Oh, he said. Hadn't meant it to sound like that, but that was how it sounded, and he had an idea that there were very few people on the planet more capable of distinguishing subtle if unintentional nuances of disappointment and irritation. Hello, said Angela the trainee. I'm disturbing you, aren't I? One of the reasons why the truth is so unpopular is that it can be so bloody inconvenient. No, he therefore said. Not a bit. Come in, only please keep your voice down. My um, partner's still asleep. A crash from the kitchen gave him the lie in its teeth. Actually... Chris said. If you wouldn't mind just waiting there a second, I'd better just tell her you're here. She might be. He tailed off. She was thinking, walking about without any clothes on, whereas he hadn't said, a bit snotty otherwise, just in case she overheard. He three quarters closed the door in Angela's face and limped into the kitchen. Oh, Karen said. You're up. He nodded. Look, he said quickly, trying to sound ever so every day about it, like he habitually interviewed work colleagues early on a Saturday morning in his pyjamas. It's a real nuisance, but someone from work's just turned up. Must be important, or... She shrugged, as if to say that nothing he did could revolt or disappoint her any more. Fine, she said. You'd better take him through into the lounge. Of course, the place is a complete disgusting tip, but he'll just have to put up with it. Chris neglected to point out the basic flaw in her assumptions. Angela always muttered, so with any look, Karen wouldn't hear her and realised she was a she. He wasn't quite sure why it mattered, but his instincts, finally horned as those of a small, vulnerable forest creature, told him it probably did. Right, he said. I I'll... And if he wants coffee, it'll have to be that crappy instant muck you bought, because there isn't anything else. Uh, OK, that's fine. Not a chance in hell that Angela would accept a coffee from him, in any case. She'd regard it as fraternising with the enemy, the sort of thing women had their hair cut off for after the liberation of Paris. For the record, he was desperate for a coffee, but he'd just have to wait. Chris snipped back into the hall and opened the door. Angela was still there, looking awkward and unwanted at him. Sorry about that, he said, with a slightly crazed smile. Come on through. You're still in your pyjamas, she said. Yes, he replied. Can I get you anything? Coffee. She gave him a look, as though he'd just demanded her firstborn child. No thanks, she said. Look, I know I'm messing up your weekend, but Mr Bernard said I had to come over. I'd have rung first, but I didn't want to disturb you. The logic of the young. Quite possibly his mind had worked that way once, though he couldn't remember any specific instances. 
It's no bother, he said. So what's... She was huddled in the armchair, looking down at her hands. Mr. Bernos says he's being hassled by the demon control authorities, she said. Apparently, they rang him at home. They need us both for questioning about that poor man at the shop. He told them he'd had a call from them earlier, saying you were a nervous wreck and suffering from post-traumatic stress. And they said they didn't know anything about that, so he called my mother and said he wanted me to go round to your place first thing in the morning. And then we could both go to their office and answer their questions. Only, if you were really at death's door, I was to call him back and he'd explain to them. She looked up and frowned at him. He said something about the second incident, whatever that means. Do you know what he meant? Chris nodded. One of them got into my car yesterday, he said. Her eyes became very large and round. What, uh, uh, yes. That's awful. What did it do? He shrugged. The self a fierce in here or... I looked in my mirror and there it was on the back seat. Then it grinned at me, kicked the door open and jumped out. And that was all, basically. But that's... She'd been about to see it. That's really unusual or something of the sort. Bad enough, she said. Did they catch it? Not yet, Chris replied. They asked me loads of questions and took my car for forensic tests. They think it might have been hiding in something I was carrying. A sanctuary, he added, remembering the technical term Jill had used. Something like a BB. You know a lot about it, Angela said. It was practically an accusation. Picked up quite a bit from them while they were interviewing me, he said. Listen, give me ten minutes to get dressed, and then I suppose we'd better be getting along if it's so urgent. When he got back, he found Karen in the living room with her. Angela was looking at something terribly interesting on the carpet, while Karen was mauling a cushion with her fingers. She looked up as he came into the room and said, How long are you going to be? and he was supposed to be at Molly and Clive's by one, and you were going to make a start in the bathroom. On the other hand, Chris thought, getting dragged out by the government on a Saturday morning had its bright side, and it was his civic duty, of course. I don't know, he said. Could be just a couple of hours, could be all day. I'll phone and... Doesn't matter, Karen snapped. I'll just have to tell Molly you're ill again, she added. But you've got to get that bathroom started. I've got the carpet on order. And he couldn't help thinking, when did it all change? Because at school and just afterwards, it was Karen who chased after me. She laughed at my jokes and smiled a lot. And once she came to a football match with me. I still love her, of course, but something changed. At which point, in some remote siding on a rural branch line of his mind, a train of thought gradually shuffled into movement. Was that your wife? Angela asked when they were outside, walking to where he'd left the car. Yes, Chris answered, because he couldn't face explaining. You mustn't mind her. She's been under a lot of pressure at work lately. It makes her a bit... Is she in the business too? He nodded. She's in the mineral rights department at Donder and Bush, scrying for natural gas deposits under the North Sea, mostly. Of course, they do it all from aerial photographs. It's a big firm, isn't it? Quite big, yes. She's assistant head of section, he added, trying to make it sound like he was boasting. She didn't seem interested. We did scrying at uni, Angela said. I was rubbish at it. It must be boring doing that all day. I don't think she does much actual scrying these days. More sort of managerial. Shouts at people, in other words. And <laughs> suppression. Oh... There was the black BMW, property of Her Majesty's government. It would have been so nice if he could have hung on to it just a little bit longer, but Jill's people would be coming to collect it that evening. Or, come to think of it, they'd probably take it off him when he got to their offices and give him the bus fare home. Life can be so... What's DS stand for? Chris's mind went blank. Then he realised he must have put yesterday's shirt on, the polo shirt he'd got from Jill's bloke. I don't know, he said. Designer shirt, probably, or somebody's name. 
He was about to say it wasn't his shirt, but he didn't. Maybe he thought it wasn't worth mentioning. And that's not your car, is it? No, it's one they lent me while... He stopped. There was something wrong with the car. He lunged closer and saw that the window had been forced open and the interior was a mess. The seats, the beautiful plush German luxury seats, a tantalising hint of a world of opulence and ease that he knew he would never attain, had been ripped up. The plastic dashboard panels were cracked and distorted where somebody had tried to prise them off and the glove compartment door was hanging loose by one mangled hinge. Fuck, Chris said. She frowned. It's a bit scruffy, she said. Was it like that when you got it? He stuck his head through the open window and looked more closely. Further desecrations. The footwell mats had been ripped out and shredded. The padded headrests had been slit open. The ashtrays had been torn out. And the attackers had put a lot of effort and ingenuity into trying to get the radio. Although... Somehow or other, it had held out and beaten the siege like Malta, though paying a dreadful price for its resistance. It was enough to break your heart. Oh, Angela was saying. Someone's tried to break into it. Chris wasn't interested in anything she might have to see. The ghastly thought had just struck him that, since it had been in his possession at the time, he might be liable for the repairs. Bastards! He mumbled, bastard bloody kids, just look what they've... I don't think it was kids, Angela said quietly. Look, she was pointing at the murdered seats, and she had her point. It wasn't just random slashes. There were five long, straight, parallel lacerations in the shape of a capital I. Someone with an excessively vivid imagination might well attribute them to a powerful, long-fingered hand tipped with very sharp claws. I think they were looking for something, she said. Oh, Chris thought. You reckon, he said, and noticed that his voice was higher and squeakier than usual. I suppose so, yes. Wasting their time, of course. That's a stupid thing. Apart from the radio, there wasn't anything in there worth nicking. How do you know? Angela said thoughtfully. He said it's not your car. For all you know, there might have been something hidden in it. Suddenly, having to peer for the damage no longer seemed the worst thing Chris could imagine. The claw marks and the strength it must have taken to crack the dash like that, even if they'd been using it, Jemmy, and he had an idea they hadn't. I suppose I'd better call the demon control people, he said wearily. If it was a, well... One of them that did this. They'll want to do all their forensic stuff on it. We'd better not touch anything. The last thing I need is another bollocking. But we're supposed to go straight to their office. Angela objected. Mr Bernard said it's really urgent. She was starting to get on Chris's nerves. Fine, he said. And exactly how do you suggest we get there? We can't drive this wreck, even if it's still running after what's been done to it. We'll smudge all the paw prints and stuff. That's all right, she said. We'll go in my car. It's parked just around the corner. It hadn't occurred to him to wonder how she'd got there. As far as he was concerned, she was just a pest who sprouted up out of the ground to torment him. Your car, he repeated. Yes, look, why don't you phone the demon people to come and see to this car and then we'll drive over to their place in mine. There was a flaw in her reasoning, but Chris was too shocked and preoccupied to bother icily at it. Yes, all right, he said distractedly. We'll do that then. Where did you say you're... He'd been expecting something ancient and beat up and studenty. But her car turned out to be an almost new shiny red Suzuki Jeep, the interior clean, tidy and smelling discreetly of air freshener. Her mother's, he rationalised, borrowed for the morning. Do you know how to get there? Chris asked as he put on his seatbelt. I don't. Angela flipped open the glove compartment and pulled out a map, printed off a computer. I got it off Google, she said. I've marked the route in yellow felt tip. Well, 
he thought. Clearly they do teach them something at university, besides how to carry their liquor and stuff newspaper into the pockets of pool tables so as to play for free. I'll map read, he offered. She started the engine. All right. Right. He studied the map, turned it the right way up, and found where they were. OK, carry on to the end of this road and turn right. Naturally, that made him think about Satnav, which in turn reminded him of what Jill had taught him. Hang on, he thought. What if it wasn't a demon that trashed the beamer? After all, demons don't have a monopoly on claws and sharp pointed teeth. The Satnav entity had broken out of the government labs, and Jill as good as told him it might come looking for him. So what if it had been Satnav, disturbed, psychotic and lovesick, who jumped the car, searching for clues that had led to him? Chris thought about that. It was a motive, maybe not a very good one, but surely rather more plausible than a mystery demon he'd never met getting fixated on him. Well? Well what? Which way now? Sorry, he mumbled and checked. Yes, fine, got it. At the roundabout, take the third... Uh, no, forget that, take the fourth exit. There isn't any roundabout, Angela pointed out. Just a junction. Do I go left here or right? Of course there's a... Uh, no, sorry, hang on. Chris added, peering at the map. Uh, that's the flyover, not the railway bridge. Uh, OK, uh, turn left here. Then carry straight on till you get to the... Truth was, he'd never been much good at maps. In fact, if map reading was an event at the 2012 Olympics, the only way he'd make the national team would be if there was a mass outbreak of the Black Death around Christmas 2011. It was a skill he hadn't needed lately, of course, because he'd had his own personal navigator perched on the dashboard, always ready with the answers. He was going to miss her... Then he pictured the BMW shredded seats and those long, steady, sweeping cuts. I don't think this is the right way, Angela said. No, we're bang on course. There's the railway line, look, so... That's the canal, not the railway line. So it was. All right, Chris said, trying to make it seem like he was indulging her in some trivial whim. Take the next right, then immediately left. I'd rather not, she said. This is a car, not a narrow boat. She had a point there. Sorry, make that left and immediately right, which ought to bring us out onto the B6603. Ten minutes later, Chris gave up. Just pull over as soon as you can, he said wearily, and you can have a look at the stupid thing. I can't make any sense of it. I mean, it just doesn't seem to bear any relation to what's actually there on the ground, if you follow me. She looked at him. Don't be silly, she said. It's a map. Which was entirely true. Bored, according to the map, the canal was over there, not right in front of them, because there were the gasworks. There was the railway. You didn't have to be bloody Lewis and Clark to figure it out, in which case the map was deliberately lying to him. Chris pulled himself together with a snap. It was, of course, possible that the Ordnance Survey was part of a vast, murky conspiracy to drive him out of his mind. But he was inclined to doubt it, all things considered. We're going to be so late, Angela said mournfully. We were supposed to go over there right away, Mr Bernos said. Hardly what he needed to hear, lost in the urban jungle. Fine, he said. As soon as you can pull over, we'll look at the map and find out where we are. Pulling over, however, wasn't that easy. Not on a dual carriageway with lorries surging around them like a school of giant dolphins. And every minute was taking them further and further in the wrong direction. Then he saw a signpost. They were only half a mile from the Ettingate Retail Park, one of those out-of-town shopping developments. Two dozen megastores and, it went without saying, ample parking facilities. Next left, he ordered gratefully. The main car park was huge, about twice the size of medieval London. It was also full. They'd driven round it twice before Chris noticed a single solitary spears, far out on the eastern spiral arm. There, he said urgently, pointing. Quick, before some other bugger... Angela might have been female, but she could park. 
Secretly and grudgingly, Chris was impressed. Maybe it'd be too much to expect her to be able to read maps as well, but he doubted she could make a worse job of it than he'd just done. She backed in, dead level, equidistant from the white lines on either side, a small miracle of off-hand precision, put on the handbrake and killed the engine. Now, Chris said, pointing at the map, if we're here, then that must be the main A6674. Suddenly everything went dark, like an eclipse. He looked up, but Angela wasn't in the driver's seat any more. It was light inside the car, but as though someone had pasted black crepe paper on all the windows. He swore and tried to open his door, but the lock operated, but the door was jammed and wouldn't move, as though he'd parked too close to the garage wall. It was also getting very, very, very cold. Not right, he told himself. This is something bad, quite probably not in Kansas anymore, and he hadn't got the faintest idea what he should do about it. The car began to rock gently from side to side. Chris tried the door handle again and yelped with pain as his fingers touched it, burning hot, presumably a hint. He whimpered, but a small part of his mind was telling him, when there's a hint, there's a hinter. If someone's trying to tell you something, then this is a deliberate, deliberate, not some random natural disaster, a deliberate one. Fair point, but he wasn't reassured. Quite the reverse, in fact. Hello, he said in a funny little quavery voice. Who's there? Excuse me. The car stopped rocking, which was good because the movement was doing things to his bladder. But that wasn't all. Everything around him, the car door, the dashboard, the roof, was gradually beginning to fade. The colour was leaching out of them, making them look like pencil outlines that hadn't been coloured in yet. He stared at the gear lever and realised he could see through it. Also, there was a distinctive smell that he was fairly sure he recognised. <laughs> Not good at all. Chris held up his hand and looked at it. At rather than through, which was something. At this rate, though, pretty soon the car was going to evaporate completely. He wriggled. Realising he was still wearing his seatbelt, tried to press the release button and squealed with terror as his thumb passed straight through it without touching anything. The belt, however, still held him firmly in the seat, which continued to bear his weight, even though it was now little more than a watercolour smudge. He jerked his head around to stare at the back window. But there was nothing to see, just black. The car went on fading, and Chris imagined what it would be like once it had gone completely, leaving him sitting in a box full of nothing with empty black walls. Somehow, he didn't fancy that at all. He'd always been a bit nervous about confined spaces, even at the best of times, of which this wasn't one. The hell with this, he told himself. Got to get out of here. Even the darkness outside the absence of windows had to be better than this, but the seat Bell, though now to all intents and purposes invisible, would not let him go. He could feel it even though he couldn't see it, and he really wished he had a knife for a pair of scissors. Hang on, Chris thought. I can do better than that. The tape measure, the pantacopt, it could cut through anything, so the book had said. Seatbelt webbing, invisible car doors, maybe it could even slice away through the solid black darkness outside. Worth a try at any rate. He took his fingers into his pocket, but it was empty. And with a pang of deep sorrow, he remembered. Early that morning, he'd fished the tape measure out of his jacket pocket. Just after Jill had rung and he'd been getting himself into a state about being stalked by this sat-nav monster. What he couldn't remember was putting it back again, in which case it was still at home, in his dressing gown pocket, maybe. Or sitting on the table in the kitchen. Marvellous, he thought. Just the fucking job. The light inside the car, or the space where the car had been, was beginning to fade, and suddenly Chris thought, hang on, I know what's happening. I must be dead. Now, listen, it all fits. That's why Angela suddenly vanished, and why I can't move. Also, the sudden cold and everything fading away. So stupid of me not to have realised before I died. Heart attack, or a stroke, or maybe there was a demon hiding in the back somewhere, and when we stopped the car, it jumped me and pulled my head off. He caught himself, adding, so that's all right then. Because it would be all right, wouldn't it? There was nothing bad or scary about death when you stopped and thought about it. 
that's perfectly natural. It happens to us all. And once you're dead, it's over. Nothing bad can ever happen to you again. Compared to the other alternative explanations, the weirdness, the implications of the world outside turning black and the car just melting away, it was positively reassuring. No, you're not, said a voice. Chris jumped in his seat as far as the invisible seat belt would let him. You're not dead, the voice said. You should be so lucky. It wasn't a nice voice. It was high and thin and scratchy, not a human voice, though he noted that it spoke flawless, received pronunciation English, accentless, like a Radio 4 announcer. It wasn't a voice that came out on the air expelled from lungs past vocal cords, regulated by the movement of lips. It was a synthesised voice, a talking thing, and he was hearing it with his mind rather than his ears. Keep perfectly still, the voice said. We'll get to you as soon as it stabilises. As soon as what does what? The feeling of calm, even euphoria that had spread over Chris when he thought he'd died, had dissipated like damp off a windscreen when you turn on the blower. Instead, he felt bitterly cold and totally vulnerable, as though all his skin had fallen off and he was just one great big open wound. Also, it'd be very nice if he could get to a toilet very, very soon. Won't take long, the voice said, and if it was trying to sound soothing, it was making a real hash of it. Then you're coming with us. I'd rather not, Chris said aloud, which made the voice laugh so much that his head shook. Not up to you, the voice said. Right, that's about it. There was nothing left of the car or the seat he'd been sitting on. He was sitting on nothing at all. He couldn't feel it even, but he was sitting rather than lying because his back was bent and his knees were at right angles to his spine. He couldn't feel the seatbelt either. But something, some force was operating on his chest, keeping him from moving. Now I'll give you three guesses, the voice said, and you've got to tell me what I am. Ready? Chris opened his mouth, but it wouldn't. Something beginning with, said the voice, with D. Death, he thought hopefully. No. Second guess. Something that pins you to a chair and tortures you? Dentist? Warmer, but no. Oh, he thought. Yes. So, Chris thought, this is it then. This time I'm really in the shit. No, being in shit really isn't that bad. It's squishy and smelly, but you survive. Your living soul isn't ripped out of your body and shredded into mush. We recommend that you select a more pertinent metaphor. At the end of all things, after fear and panic and false hope and despair, comes irritation and an unwillingness to be mucked around with by someone who thinks he's really smart. What do you want? Chris thought. Get it over with and then please go away. I really don't like you very much. All right, said the voice. Just tell me where she is and then I'll kill you. Can't say fairer than that. Where she is? I don't understand. Inside his mind, a tongue clicked impatiently, probably scaly and forked. But to him, it wasn't scary, just annoying. I don't know who you mean, he thought. Loyalty, said the voice. Courage. Heroism, even. It says in here that you don't believe in heroism. In here? In your mind. Well, it's perfectly true. I don't. Well, then, tell us where she is and then it'll all be over. And then Chris thought, hold on. If you can read my mind, why are you asking me questions? He was briefly aware of a feeling of discomfort, not his own. There's bits we can't reach, the voice said, not unless you open them for us, which you're strongly advised to do, by the way, because the bits of your mind we can reach include... Well, let's see, this bit here. Wonder what happens if I do that? 
It was a kind of pain Chris had never felt before, bearing the same relation to the worst pain he'd ever felt, that concentrated orange juice straight from the bottle bears to the diluted stuff you actually drink. It wasn't localised anywhere, like toothache or a crushed toe. It was everywhere, in everything. So that's what it does, said the voice. Fancy that! The curious thing about it, though, was that although it was agonising and excruciating and turned his brain to mush, it didn't really hurt because... And if you think that was bad, he heard the voice say, because he didn't believe in it, because it wasn't real, precisely because it wasn't in any one place, it didn't relate to anything. It was virtual pain, and he was feeling it not because he was suffering genuine physical damage, but because some evil little grey bugger was prodding a nerve centre in his brain with a pointy little fingernail. You really don't need to do that, Chris thought irritably. If I knew who you were on about, I'd tell you. You know perfectly well, said the voice. No, I don't. He snapped back, and you're too busy being cruel and merciless and all that rubbish to tell me, which is just stupid. The trouble with you is you enjoy your work too much. More pain, much more intense, but Chris ignored it and thought, you can do that till the cows come home, but it's not going to get you anywhere, but if you'll just tell me. No reply, just more pain, and he thought, I'll for crying out loud. It was, he reflected, a bit like those long, dreary rows with Karen, where she wouldn't tell him what the matter was. He was supposed to figure it out, or guess, or use telepathy, and it was bad enough when she did it, but he was prepared to put up with it from her, because she was his girlfriend, and apparently that was part of the deal. But the owner of the voice had no such claim on him, so he was rapidly running out of patience. The pain stopped. And not because the owner of the voice wanted it to. Oh, it said. And then, how are you doing that? I can't be bothered with it, Chris thought back. Now, will you answer the question? You know perfectly well. No, I don't, he thought. And then he realised. You can't say the name, right? It's some stupid rule. You can't say the name first unless I say it first. Something like that. The voice replied grumpily, but you do know you're just being difficult. Chris was feeling very tired and fed up now. All right, he decided, let's think. So he thought, and somehow he knew he'd gone into the part of his mind where the demon couldn't get in, and it was so nice to get away from it for a moment, not because of the pain or the fear, but because the demon was so obnoxiously boring and stupid. Now then, he thought, what was the question? Ah, yes, where is she? He scanned the list of possibilities. Females of his acquaintance who disappeared. It wasn't a long list, just one. In fact, Angela the trainee, who'd been sitting next to him and had just then vanished. Hello, he thought. I'm back. Well, I think I know who you're on about. Chris thought, but I'm afraid the answer's still the same. I don't know. Yes, you do! The voice screamed at him, rather childishly in his opinion. She was with you in the car. Her smell was all over the seat. Yes, that's right, he thought wearily. She was with me, but now she's gone. You can see that for yourself. She just vanished, and I haven't got a clue where she's gone to. Surely you can tell if I'm lying to you or not. Well, a long pause. Then the voice said, Shit. So you agree? I'm telling the truth. Looks like it. The voice conceded unhappily. Right then, Chris thought briskly. In that case, you'd better get on and kill me, hadn't you? Come to that, you might even let me go. Silence. Then, just as he was starting to wonder, the voice laughed and then said, Nice try! At which point, all that calm, stoical acceptance that had purged him of the fear of death sizzled away like milk on a hot stove, and terror came flooding back, and Chris discovered that, after all, he really, really didn't want to die, especially not if there was even the remotest chance that it would hurt. He launched himself at the invisible seat belt, which bounced him sharply back against the invisible seat, so he tried to wriggle sideways and found he couldn't do that either. 
and he couldn't hear the voice anymore and that was all the confirmation he needed because anybody could see that demons aren't the sort of creatures who talk to their food. But there was another voice. One that Chris recognised. Get away from him, she shouted. And he heard the demon hiss, not with his mind but with his ears. Then a noise, just like a butcher cleaving through a thick joint of beef. And a scream, not human. And the ding of one metal object glancing off another. Then another scream, as much as rage as pain. And the sound of a woman grunting with effort. And then the light came on. It was like when Karen suddenly switched on the bedside lamp when she'd woken up in the middle of the night and needed to read for a bit before she could get back to sleep. The sudden glare was like a slap on the face and Chris instinctively turned his head away from it. When he looked back, he saw her, the most beautiful creature he'd ever seen. Not just film star or supermodel beautiful, they are after all only human. The point being, she obviously wasn't in fact he rationalised later. She didn't actually look all that much like a human female, or rather she looked like the original, of which human beings are cheap knock-off copies you buy your market stalls. Human skin doesn't glow, and neither does human hair shimmer. It's too thick and stiff and hard, although you don't notice it until you get a chance to take a good close look at the real thing. She was dressed in some sort of silvery thing that was either scales or feathers or somehow or other both. She was leaning forward with both hands on the grip of a sword. Except it wasn't. Where the blade should have been, there was just a long, thin black line, so thin it barely made three dimensions. And the light he was staring at her by came, he realised, from her skin and hair and that funny silvery dress... It defined the shape where the car had been, but there was nothing contained in that space besides the two of them and a moderate helping of air. It's you, Chris heard himself say. I recognised your voice. She turned her head to face him, and her eyes were as bright as a welder's arc, burning half-moons across his retina as her head moved. I don't think so, she said. Yes, it is. It's you, he insisted. You're her. You're Satnav. The eyes flared. He raised his hand to shield himself from them, but it did no good. He could still see them through his own palm. Oh, shut up, she said, and she swung the sword up and brought it swishing down, straight at him. Chris opened his mouth to scream, but nothing came out, and he felt the unseen seatbelt give way. Without it to restrain him, he rolled forward out of the invisible seat, and as he fell towards the solid black ground, the light faded, not to pitch black, but to a gloomy sort of twilight, because that was how dim and feeble ordinary daylight was in comparison. He sat up. He was sitting on the tar back of a parking space in the Ettingate retail car park, in between an old red Volvo and a silver Peugeot and there was a thin smear of blood seeping through his shirt front from a shallow graze, roughly where a seat belt would normally have crossed his chest. Eee! I reckon there was a portable car parking space right there. I reckon it was a trap. But what part does Angela play? (laughs) Dun-dun-dun! By all means, give me your theories. If you've already read the books, shh! Let everybody guess. We all know what's going on. We do, really. (laughs) So I'll try and get another chapter in for you in the next couple of days. As ever, if you could bing bing the notification spell and hit the like button if you enjoyed this one. Let me know what you think about the other demon's voice. It was only temporary, but I'm thinking the whole thing on these ones is that everyone's got to be some sort of electronic um, automated voice, which is going to be fun to do. It's going to be very much fun to do, but I digress. (laughs) What have you got planned for the next few days? What's your week looking like? Are you working this week? Are you on holiday this week? And how are you doing in yourself? I hope you're all tickety-boo. We like this thing. (laughs) Anyway, I'll stop waffling and, and we're going to crack on so we can get more stuff done. So I've got plenty of time to do another chapter for you. So yes, take it easy. Stay safe. Get good rest. 
Have some chocolate or some cake or even some biscuits, especially chocolate hobnobs if you can have them, if you enjoy them. Right, yes, I'm going to waffle off now. <laughs> me, 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 I'm waffling off. <laughs> I will get a tune sorted at some point. Right, I'm going. Take it easy, pal. <laughs>